Goodness, I've almost 40 years now. I'm 55. Wow. 35 years I've known Bill Payne. Uh, Bill was a member of, of uh, Grace Bible Church in Corpus Christi where I got saved under the ministry of the pastor there, Jim Williamson, many years ago. But uh, Bill's family, Bill Payne and his wife, Deanna Payne, were uh, pillars in the church, if you will. There's no, no other word for them, just pillars in the church. I'm telling you this because I was overcome with emotion yesterday at that funeral. There were three people that got up, besides the pastor, Robbie Dean, a dear friend of mine, uh, there were three people that got up to say words about Bill. And one of them was his grandson, Travis Franklin. And I know Travis very, very well because Travis was one of my early youth boys. Uh, I, I raised Travis in my youth ministry uh, for several years. So not only do I know Bill and Deanna, I know Travis's parents. And I got to know Travis very well through the ministry of the camp I was involved with for almost 10 years, Travis spoke. You know what he spoke about? The Christian heritage his grandfather left. The building block of biblical Christianity that his granddad uh, laid down for his parents to learn from and for him to, for, for him to learn from. He lifted his grandfather up as a godly man who taught him the Bible. And the next guy that got up was a man named Joe Bob Frederick. He's Travis's age. I've known Joe Bob since he was a little bitty boy. He's now a, uh, an instructor in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, he's a SIM instructor, flew C-130s for the Marine Corps for years. Uh, lost a brother in the United States Navy in an F-18 Super Hornet accident. But you know what Joe Bob Frederick stood up and talked about? Jesus, the Savior of the world. And he talked about Bill... Pain and how all the things that Bill Payne meant to him, uh, the greatest thing that Bill gave him and extended, exuded out from his person was his Christianity, was the fact that he was a godly man. And Joe Bob praised him for that. And the next man that got up to speak, the last one was Joe Bob's father, Larry Frederick, another dear friend of mine from Corpus Christi. Uh, and Larry, you know what Larry spoke about? I don't know that he uttered Bill's name at all, Larry gave the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as clearly as it can be given. He invited everybody in the church to believe what Bill believed so that they could go be with Bill if they wanted to and continue their relationship with Bill Payne by simply believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was overcome with the motion while I was sitting there looking around the room, and I hope that you will be too, understanding our Christian heritage it was astounding to me to be able to go back 35 years in my life and see where God intervened in my life, presented himself to me as the one true God, and I accepted it. And all those people that were in that church, all those people who spoke, even Bill Payne, the deceased, my friend Robbie Dean, I went from, I went from a, a young kid in belief, and I was just thinking about all the gifting that God has given me over the 55 years of my life and how I have become what I am because of men like Bill Payne and men like Robbie Dean whose shoulders I stand on uh, as a pastor. A lot of, of just a lot of wonderful grace, grace, grace was all over the service yesterday and I was just overcome by it. Everything that God has given me in this life. And so uh, I hope that you are too. I hope that you take, take time in your lives to remember the things uh, that God has done. There's a passage in Samuel that we might talk about today if we get to it. We, we, we will just brush over it if we do get to it, where Samuel takes rocks and he sets up stones of rocks. He sets up these rocks in a little pyramid as a remembrance of the fact that God has taken us this far so, uh, this far to this point, God has helped us. It's called the Ebenezer, the rock of help, Ebenezer. If we're in 1 Samuel chapter 4, remember that Israel is at a city called Ebenezer. This is the place where Samuel will come back and, and uh, once he defeats the Philistines, Samuel will come back and build this stone, uh, this stone pillar of remembrance to God. 
so that every time a Jew goes by Ebenezer, they can look at that stone and remember what God had done for Israel. I don't know what our stones are in life. I don't know what our stone pillars are in life, but I hope you have them. I hope there are those things that you see that remind you of everything that God has done in your life. Because, Christian, I promise you, it's more than you could ever imagine the daily things that God does for you and the daily things that he does for me. Just wanted to share that with you. <clears throat> we are in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4. What we're seeing here is that Israel takes the Ark of the Covenant this precious golden overlaid acacia wood box, and they take it into battle like a lucky charm. They're not petitioning. I don't want you to miss this as we go through this. They're not petitioning the help of Yahweh. They're not, they're not coming because they've lost 4,000 men and bowing down at the tabernacle before Yahweh, bringing their sacrifices, trying to figure out, like in past days, what is our sin? Why has God allowed this defeat uh, at the battle of Ai, 300 years earlier when Joshua was bringing Israel into the land, God allowed a defeat. But it was much, much different because at that time, Israel went to Yahweh and said, what have we done wrong? And Yahweh let them know that Achan had taken some of the spoil from Jericho and there was a big scene and you can go back and read about it uh, in the pages of Joshua. But the fact is, this generation of Israel... This generation of Jews is not seeking the guidance of Yahweh. They just want his box. Because they think if we take this holy relic into battle with us, we'll have good luck. And God has to give us the victory. <clears throat> well, as, uh, as we see, as we saw, Israel was soundly defeated in this second battle against the Philistines, where not 4,000, but 30,000 Jewish men died. And we will see that because they took this ark into the battlefield, let it out of the tabernacle, there will be serious consequences for those who should have been overseeing the ark, protecting it, keeping it, guarding it, worshiping at it. Not worshiping it, worshiping God at the ark. And those are the high priest Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, the high priests in line. They will all die in this battle. Even the Philistines, as we talked about last time, the Gentile, pagan, non-Yahweh worshiping Philippines. When I say that, I want you to understand what I mean. They did not worship Yahweh at all. They worshiped false gods, false that, gods that don't exist, that never have existed. Fig, uh, uh, figments of man's imagination, that's what these people worshiped. They worshipped a god called Dagon. But even the Philistines had sense enough to know that when they saw the Ark of the Covenant of God, they were in trouble because they had heard about Israel's God. In 1 Samuel 4, just to pick up where we were last time, the Philistines were afraid. They should have been. For they said God has come into the camp when they saw the Ark come in. They said, woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. In the next verse, it says, woe to us, who shall deliver us? How in the world can we win in battle against this God? Woe to us, who shall deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? Now, we know that Israel only worships one God. There is only one God. His name is Yahweh. But the Philistines had the theology wrong. They thought Israel worshipped multiple gods, but nonetheless, they knew that Israel's God was present. And they were fearful of it. These are the gods, it says. Again, their theology, their understanding of exactly who God was and what He did was a little bit off. But they understood His power. These are the gods who smote the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. So like I said, uh, in the wilderness, you could take offense to or, or at least rebut the fact that uh, when God's ten plagues were on Egypt, they weren't in the wilderness, they were in Egypt. So their theology is not absolutely accurate, the Philistines, but that's okay. The fact of the matter is they understood that Yahweh was a powerful God not to be reckoned with. 
And so they had to gird themselves up in this fight. They had to talk themselves up. The leaders of the Philistines had to get the confidence of the army up because everybody knew this God killed the Egyptians. Uh, but foolishly, they went into battle against the Israeli God. As we'll see, this doesn't end well for, Philist for, for the Philistines. I want to tell you again before we go too far into this that the Ark of the Covenant, this is the story of the Ark of the Covenant in these few chapters. In 1 Samuel and in 2 Samuel, the Ark is spoken of 61 times. 61 times do we see the name Ark, the word Ark of the Covenant, and it's in these four chapters that we're in, 4, 5, 6, and 7, the Ark will be mentioned 36 times. What happens in 1 Samuel chapter 8? Anybody know? Israel says, we don't want God to be our king anymore. We want a human king. These chapters 4, 5, 6, 7 are leading up to Israel's eventual and complete rejection of Yahweh. And the ark is mentioned 36 times in these four chapters leading up to Israel saying, we're out. We want a human king. The ark then, as I've told you, I'll keep telling you, represents the very presence of God. And so the ark is going to come to represent Israel's perspective of Yahweh. How are they thinking about their relationship with this living God? How are they worshiping Yahweh? Is it a proper relationship? Is it right? Is it in keeping with the Mosaic law? Or are they walking further and further away from Yahweh? The ark and the way they treat the ark. This is what I'm trying to tell you. The way Israel treats the ark, the holiest beast of the holiest item, if you will, on earth. The way they treat that ark is a, uh, a forbearance of the way they're going to treat the living God, when in chapter 8 they say, we don't want him anymore. We want a human king. We no longer want to go into battle with Yahweh. We don't, maybe because they lost so badly to the Philistines, 34,000 in total, maybe that was part of why they didn't want Yahweh to lead them in battle anymore. Maybe they thought Yahweh had failed them. Very interesting, uh, the mind of the Jew at this time. But what is Yahweh reminding them? In this movement of the ark, you won't see this full picture until the ark goes to Philistia and we start seeing God, without the Jewish army, defeat the gods of the Philistines. The ark represents the presence of Yahweh, the God of Israel. The fact that He is the only God, not Dagon, not the Philistine God, not any God of the Canaanites. Yahweh is the only God who's ever existed. He is the creator of all things. He maintains all things. By the word of His power, what God says goes. He is alive and powerful. And Israel needs to learn this, and so do the Philistines. Because we serve a God that desires for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Does God desire that these Philistines be saved? What's the answer to that question? Well, of course He does. He's teaching them as much as He is teaching Israel. He's also teaching through the movement of the ark here that He is sovereign. He is the supreme ruler of everything. Everything that exists. He has all authority on earth over all the people on earth, Jews and Gentiles alike. God is the supreme. He is the king of the universe. Certainly the king of Israel. So the ark comes to represent these things, and there's a reason why, because it's not just a golden box. Remember what's in it and what's on it. Inside the ark of God at this time, at least we have the copies of the Ten Commandments. We have the tablets of the covenant, the tablets of the law that God gave Moses. What do the tablets represent? The will of God for Israel. This is exactly how I want you to live. This is exactly how I want you to worship me. This is exactly how our relationship can be wonderful. And this is also a reminder of how our relationship can go south. If you disobey me, there will be cursing. But if you obey me, there will be blessing. All found in the Mosaic law inside 
the ark. So the will of God for Israel was found inside that ark. Will Israel follow God according to the law? The ark comes to represent the fact that Israel is not following Yahweh. They don't want to follow the law. They're a disobedient people, uh, certainly in this generation. What else is in the ark or on the ark? The mercy seat. That golden lid where the cherubim are on it, the two angels with their outstretched wings touching each other, that golden mercy seat above the ark was Israel's lifeline to the very presence of God, to fellowship, ongoing fellowship with an ever-present God. Uh, the ark represented all of those things. Not only represented it, the ark is the place. God very clearly told Moses, it's from here, it's here that I will dwell above the mercy seat, and it's from here that I will speak to you all the commandments for Israel. Not an ordinary box. And Israel is playing with this box. They're not seeking, again, Yahweh, the God who can help them. They just take his holy relic and say, we'll take this into battle and that should be enough. And they will find out very quickly that it's not. So in these verses, 36 times the ark is spoken of in chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7, showing Israel's perspective, their dwindling, their regressive relationship and perspective on their God, Yahweh. Until we get to chapter 8 and they say, we don't want you anymore. And what does God prove to the world in these four, in these four chapters? We're going to see that. Verse 10, 2 Sam, or 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 10, So the Philistines fought. Israel was defeated. Every man, the Jews, fled to his tent, and the slaughter was very great. For there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. This defeat should get Israel's attention. They should come to understand Yahweh has allowed this defeat, a major defeat of 30,000 Jews. Something must be wrong in our relationship with Yahweh. He's our protector. Something must be wrong in our relationship with Yahweh. It's not Him that's left us. It has to be us that's left Him. There must be sin in the camp. We must be doing something wrong or else Yahweh would bless us with victory. That should have been what Israel was thinking, but it's not. The treatment, again, the treatment of the ark is a precursor to their treatment of Yahweh. It's showing us exactly what Israel thinks about their God. Uh, and make no mistake, in this battle, the Philistines defeated Israel. They did not defeat Yahweh, and we will see that very clearly in chapter 5. They defeated Israel, not Israel's God, Yahweh. Verse 11, the ark of God was taken. The two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas died. The most important statement in that is that the ark was taken. It, is now, it has now left Shiloh, the city where it was. It's left the tabernacle where God had planted it, where God intended it to always be in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. It has left there. And the ark of God, the most holy relic on earth, is in the hands of pagan, non-Yahweh worshiping, anti-God Gentiles. And that's not good. We saw a messenger come in verse 16. Let's go down to verse 16. The man said to Eli, it's a man from the battlefield, I'm the one who came from the battle line. Indeed, I escaped from the battle line today. And the man said, or Eli asked him, how did things go, my son? And he says, uh, Israel has fled before the Philistines. That means we were defeated. He gives an account of the battle. Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great slaughter among the people. And he keeps giving the information to the man, Eli, the high priest. And your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been taken. This is the custodian of the ark of God. This is the high priest of Israel. This is, listen, this is the only man in Israel who has ever laid eyes on the ark of the covenant. The high priest only goes into the Holy of Holies one day of year. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, that's the only day that one man in all of Israel can go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat for the national sins of Israel to be uh, forgiven. One day, one man, 
and his name is Eli in this period of Israel. But now all of a sudden, what has happened with the Ark of the Covenant, it's gone from being the holiest piece of furniture on earth to being commonplace. Now common people have seen it. Hophni has seen it. Phineas has seen it. The soldiers have seen it. The people of Shiloh have seen it leave their town. No eye was supposed to see it. Do you realize that even when the ark uh, or when the tabernacle was moving around in the wilderness, and I think you could count 34 or 37, I forget the number of times, when Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness, they moved all the time. The tabernacle was picked up and transferred to another city following the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire by night. Remember the story? Wherever God led, they would go. Every time the Ark of the Covenant was moved, it was covered. No man laid eyes on that box. Every time it was moved by the Kohathite Levites, the, the, the sons of Kohath were the ones that had the... Uh, the duty of moving the holy furniture, the ark, the altar of uh, incense, the table of showbread, the menorah, the lampstand. Only the people of Kohat could do that. And when they moved the ark, if you go back into Genesis, or not Genesis, but Exodus, and see how God instructed them to move it, it had a covering over it. Human eyes didn't look on that box, except for one set of human eyes, the high priest one day of the year. And now we have this box, this holy ark, having been profaned by Israel. Eli, the, the custodian of the box, when he hears that that box is gone, that's what kills him. Not that Israel lost in battle, not that his sons Hophni and Phinehas were dead. What destroys his soul is the fact that the ark is taken. Look what it says in the next verse. When he mentioned the ark of God in verse 18, Eli fell off the seat backward beside the gate. His neck was broken and he died. He was very old and heavy. He judged Israel 40 years. He was the high priest for that amount of time, not the judge. Samuel would be the last judge of Israel. That's a... Not an important point, we'll go on. But the fact of the matter is, if you'll see what it says there, when the messenger mentioned the ark of God, that's what shook Eli. And that's what made him lose balance. That's what made him fall off of his stool, hit his head, break his neck, and kill him. There's another part to this story. There's another heartbreak in this story. We read about it in verse 19. Look what it says. This is about Eli's daughter-in-law. It says, Now his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, remember he has two sons, Hophni and Phineas. Phineas had a wife, and she was pregnant. It says, Now his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was pregnant and about to give birth. When she heard the news that the ark of God was taken, what news is it that triggered her response? the news that the ark of God was taken. Even more so than the fact that her husband was killed in battle. When she heard the news that the ark of God was taken and the order is important and that her father-in-law, her husband, had died and her husband had died, she kneeled down and gave birth for her pains came upon her. Now there is a Jewish historian named Josephus who wrote after the days of Jesus, so we're talking about a thousand, thousand years later, but the historian Josephus in his writing says that this lady, Phineas's wife, was seven months pregnant. Just Jewish rabbinic, rabbinic tradition says that this woman was seven months pregnant, which would mean uh, that the news of the ark caused her to start a premature labor. That's a dangerous labor. It's a dangerous labor today. It was certainly dangerous thousands of years ago. And so that's why it says she was close to giving birth, but not in the process of it. But it was this news that caused her uh, to start this premature delivery. And it caused complications. And what we see is that in the process of giving birth to this firstborn son... <laughs> She died. 
More heartache. Verse 20 says, And at about the time of her death, she had delivered the child. I would assume she was bleeding badly. She was dying from the birth. It says, At about the time of her death, the, woman, the women who stood by her said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have given birth to a son which should have been and always was the best news a Jewish mother could hear. The birth of a son who would carry on the name of the family, who would inherit the property, the rights. A son, a firstborn son was everything in Israel, but it meant nothing to her. The ark of God was taken. And even the news, the glorious news of a firstborn son, didn't affect her the way it should have. All she could think about was the terrible news of the day, the ark of God has been taken. My family is gone. In verse 21, it says, And she called the boy Ikavod. Ichabod. Ikavod. And this is what she said when she named her son right before she took her last breath. The glory has departed from Israel. What is she talking about? The glory of God who said that He would dwell above the mercy seat which sits above the Ark of the Covenant. When she understood that that Ark of the Covenant wasn't coming back to Shiloh, it caused her to start a premature delivery which was dangerous to her. And so she named her son accordingly. The Hebrew word for glory is the word kavod, kavod, C-H-A-B-O-D. You can see it clearly in E kavod. The Hebrew word for glory is kavod, C H A B O D. When you add the I to the front of a Hebrew word, you negate it. It's like in English, we would add an A. I'm not a Gnostic, I'm an agnostic. I don't have knowledge, I have no knowledge. You see what I mean? In Hebrew, you use an I to do that. So E kavod. If she'd have named the boy Kavod, she would have named him Glory. When she names him E Kavod, she names him No Glory. That's the boy's name. No Glory. No Glory is what it means. She said in verse 22, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been taken. She gives her son the name that all Israel would remember forever when E. Kavod was born. The glory of God had departed all Israel. That's what his name means. Uh, a question, had she adopted the pagan view, and this may be true, that since the Ark of the Covenant is where God existed and the Ark was now in Gentile lands and not in Israel, had she adopted the pagan custom, and she may have, that since the presence of God wasn't there, God wasn't there anymore, their help, the rendering of aid was over. There was no glory in Israel. God was gone, had abandoned them. He may not come back. That may be what she was thinking when she named her son E. Kavod. Israel has lost the presence of God, and we've lost it for good. I say that's a pagan view because it's a geographic limitation of a god. Uh, this is what I mean by that. The Canaanite gods, uh, they came by several names, but one of their names was Baal, Baal, Baal. Uh, and he was a geographic god. The pagan mindset meant or, or thought that wherever Baal was when they were in their land, they were safe because Baal was present there, but if they were to wander off to Aramea or somewhere else, they couldn't take Baal with them. He was geographically limited. He was the god of the Canaanites. The Philistine god was Dagon. They didn't carry him into battle. He was a geographically limited god. He was a national god of the people of Philistia. And I wonder if this Phineas' wife had adopted this pagan idea that God also, since he's outside of the land now, since he's in Philistia, he's geographically limited like all the other gods are, and he can't help Israel anymore. Now, that's a pagan idea. It's totally false. It's false because we know that God is omnipresent. He's all places at all times. But this definitely happened. Listen to this. This most certainly happened when the ark left Israel. 
the blessing of His glorious presence was taken from them. The blessing of His glorious presence in dwelling among Israel was taken. He was not dwelling among them like He was before. He dwelt among, uh, above the mercy seat and the ark. This is simply the way He set it up. That His glorious presence, in addition to the omnipresence of God being all places at all times, in addition to that, He made a dwelling for Himself above the mercy seat. And that had been, uh, been taken. Uh, Israel was on a downward spiral, a very dangerous and bad, bad, bad downward spiral away from God. And part of what this woman was probably thinking is that we have forfeited Israel has forfeited the blessing of the presence of God. The glory has left Israel because the ark is gone. How far you want to take that, uh, that's up to you. But when we think, uh, we can't have this pagan view that God is far from us because He never is. I'm going to show you one New Testament verse. The fact of the matter is that when we think God is far from us, we are wrong. Have you ever had the thought that God must have left? He's just so far from me right now. I feel so disconnected from a relationship with God right now. Who is it that's moved? Omnipresent God or me and you? Who is it that's moved away? Omnipresent God or me and you? In the book of James chapter 4, in verse 8, just a great little piece of Bible, James James, the whole book of James, but certainly chapter 4, James gives us this truth. He says, as if God is waiting, you draw near to God, and as a result, He will draw near to you. It's not God who's left, it's God who's waiting for us to draw near to Him. That's the order of events. He's given us everything, He's given the Scriptures, He's revealed Himself to us. If we want Him, He's open arms. If we don't, it's your decision. God is ready, willing, and able at all times to receive us. It's us that chooses whether to draw near to Him or not. God never leaves. It's us that leaves. God didn't leave Israel is the point. Who left who? Israel was leaving God. And this mention of the ark over and over and their, uh, their attitude toward the safekeeping of the ark is reminiscent of what they think about their God. Israel has abandoned the worship of Yahweh, not God. Yahweh didn't do this. Israel did this. Yahweh would still be safe and sound in the Holy of Holies above the mercy seat if the foolish elders of Israel hadn't taken him from there. They did this. He did not. They used the ark like a lucky charm, and it didn't work. It was mere lip service, a spectacle for human eyes to witness. We have the ark. Yeah, but you don't have a relationship with God. You can have the holiest piece of relic there is on earth. But without a relationship with God, you've got nothing. And Israel's relationship with God was all but destroyed. National Israel. Of course, I always have to say there is a remnant. There's always that holy and glorious remnant, those people in Israel that were obeying God as best they could, following through with the Mosaic Law. There's always a remnant. He always keeps a, keeps a witness to His glory on earth. There was a Jewish remnant, but national Israel, for the most part, had turned their back on Yahweh, and that's what we're driving to in 1 Samuel chapter 8 when they say, we're done with you. We want a human king. So this defeat and this loss of 34,000 Jewish soldiers was Yahweh's way of making Israel refocus on what really matters. It should have gotten their attention. 34,000 Jewish men killed in a couple of days. And it should have gotten their attention, God's grace in action, letting them know, I'm here, I'm available, turn to me, draw near to me. According to, as a Jew, according to the Mosaic Law, 
and I'll come back. So uh, he was extending his offer of love and grace and compassion and mercy and forgiveness, but Israel didn't take it. Israel simply did not take it as they marched toward the full rejection of Yahweh in 1 Samuel chapter 8. So a proper relationship with Yahweh was not in their minds. Again, what is Yahweh trying to remind Israel? Same slide again, that the ark represents His presence, that He's the only God, He's alive and powerful, and He is sovereign. He controls and has authority over everything He's created. Fell on deaf ears. Completely deaf ears. 34,000 boys dead. Completely deaf ears in Israel. Nobody cried out to God. No one said, what is our sin that God has allowed us to lose 30,000 of His chosen people? What are we doing wrong? How do we need to draw near to God? Nobody asked the question. At least most of them didn't. Uh, let me ask you a question. How can Israel get the ark back? The ark will go to five different cities in, in uh Philistia before it's returned to Israel. My question at this point, knowing what you know right now, how can Israel get the ark back? What's the answer? There's an answer. How can they get it back? Let me ask you a couple more questions. Can they get it back through military efforts? Or is their army clearly being defeated by the Philistines over and over and Yahweh allowing it? Can they go into the battle, into the battlefield again against the Philistines? Can they march into Ashdod and overtake the Philistines and regain their ark? Yes or no? No. How can they get that ark back? The answer is they can't. They are completely inept. They do not have the power, the authority. They have nothing going for themselves for which that ark can come back into Shiloh, into its proper place in the tabernacle. Nothing. They have forfeited the presence of the living God and maybe forever because they do not have the power to get that ark back. So who has to step in and save the day? Well, Yahweh does, doesn't he? Now let me ask you another question. When the ark rolled back into Israeli territory, did Israel deserve it? Had they done anything to deserve the great grace of God, this outpouring of love and generosity from God, from Yahweh? Did they deserve for God to bring the ark back to them, the custodians of the ark? Not in any way. But did he do it anyway? Why did he do it? Whose character, listen to the question, Whose character is on display in these chapters? Israel's or God's? It's God. It's Yahweh showing who He is. The promise-keeping God, the God who had called Abraham out from Ur of the Chaldees and said, get away from your family, leave your father's home to a land that I will show you. I'll give you this land. I'll give you descendants as numerous as the sand of the seashore. I will bless you, Abraham, and you will be a blessing. And every family on earth will be blessed through your, you, you and your descendants. He made promises to Abraham. These are Abraham's people. This is Israel. And there is no way that God, the promise maker, is going to allow His presence to go into Gentile, non-God-worshipping area and be stuck there. God intervenes personally in human history. When you pray to God, do you expect Him to intervene personally in your affairs? Yes. Why do you pray that? Why do you think omniscient creator God has any care for you? Because in this book, friend, he tells us over and over and over that he cares for us, that he loves us. Be anxious for nothing. Cast all your cares on the Lord because he cares for you. And you say, oh, well, that sounds real good, but prove it. 
Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 4. He proves it over and over and over to humanity that his promises to mankind will never be broken. He cannot be shaken. He cannot change. He is eternally who he is today. His character, his alive and powerful character, his character as being sovereign, his, his characteristics, his attributes cannot change. And it's totally on display in this story where the foolish Israelites, I'm so tired of having to add that adjective foolish when I say Israelites. It brings me no joy to say that. But the foolish Israelites here in allowing the ark of God to leave Israel have to be saved by God by grace. It's a very interesting picture, I think, about the presence of God, the salvation of God at the cross of Jesus Christ. Undeserving humanity, sinful humanity, disobedient humanity comes to the cross. God says, I'll do all the work. I will intervene personally in human history. I will fix everything. And that's exactly what he does in uh, chapter 5. God steps in without a Jewish person one and brings the ark back to Israel. No Jewish army, just the God of Israel. <clears throat> chapter 5, look what it says. Yahweh demonstrates His sovereignty not only over Israel, but over the nations, over the Gentiles. A fantastic Bible chapter. Now the Philistines took the ark of God, brought it from Ebenezer, where the Jews had it in battle, to Ashdod. Here is a map. Here on the, on the uh, right-hand side is a blow-up of what is in that little red circle on the left. Here's Jerusalem. I always like to put Jerusalem on a map. This body of water right here is the Dead Sea. This is the Jordan River. So there's Jerusalem. Here's the battle site. Here's Eben Azer, the stone of help where Israel was. You can see Shiloh to the right of it, 30 or 40 miles away. And you see Afek, where the Philistines were, on the uh, left side of that white map, right here in this blue circle. After the battle, what happens, you can see the black arrow goes down. They take the ark, look at it, the wanderings of the ark. They take the ark from Afek and they bring it down to this coastal, this is the Mediterranean Sea. They bring it down to this coastal town called Ashdod. And look what they do with it. Let me, let me remind you of one thing before we look at what they do with it. When the Philistines saw the Ark of the Covenant come into the battlefield, what was their reaction? Fear. They were scared to death of this Ark because it represented the presence of Yahweh, the God had, that had slew the Egyptians. They were fearful of the Ark. But what has changed? What has changed since their fear and their building up of their soldiers, what event has taken place that has changed their attitude about Yahweh, this God of Israel? They just beat them in battle. They just killed 30,000 more Jewish men than the 4,000 they had killed a couple days before. They have soundly defeated the armies of Israel who should have been protected by their God, Yahweh. You get the point? So the Philistines here, all of a sudden, standing taller, chest puffed out. There's an amazing shift in the thinking of the Philistines after one battle. Again, before the battle, they were terrified. After the battle, now all of a sudden, all spit and vinegar. We can do anything. Our God, Dagon, has defeated the Jewish God, Yahweh. That's the thought. Is that true? No, that's not true at all. But in their minds, you can hear them thinking he isn't as strong as we thought he was. This God of Israel, this great God who slew the Egyptians, he's not as strong as we thought he was. Our God defeated the great God, Yahweh. And so they put Yahweh's ark, the ark of the covenant, 
depicted in the picture on the left, they put Yahweh's holy ark on the side of their god, Dagon, in his temple in the city of Ashdod. So check that picture out. He's got a temple built for himself. The Philistines uh, have built a temple to their false god, Dagon, and he's got a statue there of himself. This is how he's depicted as a man with a fish's tail. He's a fish god. Remember the Philistines were a sea peoples that came in uh, 2000 BC in Abraham's day. And then they again flooded into Canaan in uh, 1200 BC, a hundred or so years before the events we're talking about. Can you imagine that? In the temple of a false god, this god Dagon, in the presence of a statue of Dagon, they place like a trophy of victory the ark of the living God, creator of the heavens and the earth. There's not a Jew in sight. This is all Gentile and their relationship with God on display. How is God going to handle His ark being deposited in a pagan temple at the feet of a non-existent pagan God who humans that God created are worshiping when they should have been worshiping Him? What we're about to see here is Yahweh without a Jewish army, make no mistake, it's not the power of the army that does anything. He's going to bring these Gentile Philistines to their knees the way only God can. He is showing them that He is alive and powerful, that He is the only God, and that He is sovereign over all of His creation. Only Yahweh deserves to be worshipped. There is no other God. What grace He shows to these Gentiles. It says in verse 3, when the Ashdodites arose early in the morning. So what do we see here? The Philistines took the ark of God in verse 2. Sorry, I skipped it. The Philistines took the ark of God. They brought it to the house or the temple of Dagon and they set it by Dagon. Maybe even on the right hand of Dagon. Can you imagine? Like Jesus is seated at the right hand of his God, our God, not his God, our God, right now. So they set the Ark of the Covenant beside Dagon as if to say, Dagon, you defeated this God in battle. Here is his representation. This is your trophy. You have won. When the Ashdodites arose early in the morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and they set him up in his place again. Isn't that interesting? The worshipers of this stone god have to lift up their god. They have to help him up and prop him back up onto his tail. Not his feet, but his tail. Isn't that an interesting thought? Worshippers of the god have to help the god up. Some god, huh? It's interesting. Now what's going on here? Has it not hit them yet what happened overnight? That this Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, the very presence of God who was there above the mercy seat, that the presence of God and the presence of this false stone God toppled that God overnight. Can they not see that? Or were they trying desperately to hide the fact? Were they trying desperately to ignore the reality of what just happened, what took place overnight, that Yahweh was indeed defeating their God Dagon? without a man in sight. Dagon was inferior to Yahweh and fell down in his presence. Look what it says in the next verse. After they prop him up, in verse 4, it says, But when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And so he fell down yet again, but this time it was worse. It says, And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. So the second time they, they uh, go in the next morning, we see something different. This fish god's head has been taken off. His hands have been broken off. He's no longer able to be propped up. A crushing defeat of the Philistine false god Dagon. 
by the one true God, creator God, sovereign God, Yahweh. The Philistines should have gotten the idea, the picture, because what happens here in the temple of God, Dagon is obvious. Yahweh is superior to your false God. I have defeated him in the same way you heard that I defeated the Egyptian gods in the ten plagues. I've done it again. I've done it again. <clears throat> and there's more to this story, and I'd like to ask more about it. But I'll go long if I do. Let me just introduce this. Could there be something else going on here? It's very true and obvious that Yahweh has defeated the false god Dagon. He has fallen down. His head is cut off. His hands are cut off. He is no longer able to be worshipped, this stone god. This is what I mean. Could something else be going on here? Because Dagon is an artifact, an idol cut from stone. Right? Who created the stone? Is stone, rock, stone part of God's creation? Yes, it is. Stone has no life. I want you to start thinking in your head, stone. Where does stone, where does rock and stone come into your, uh, into your biblical minds? Where is stone spoken of in the Bible? It has no life. We know this. It's inanimate. It can't do anything on its own, but it can be carved into something else like a pagan idol. But at the end of the day, even if it's in the form of a pagan idol, it is still part of God's creation. He owns the stone. It's his. There are a couple of very interesting things. I just want you to back up for a second and see what's happening here in Ashdod. No human is worshiping Yahweh. The Jews aren't worshiping Yahweh. They're treating him like a good luck charm. They need him. They use him when they need him. When they don't need him, they put him on a shelf. The Jews aren't worshiping Yahweh, and neither are the Philistines. There's no human on the scene that's worshiping Yahweh. And when humans don't worship Yahweh, what does Jesus say? Even the stones will cry out. Very interesting. This motif of stone. Now I'm not, don't take it further. I'm not saying that stones have life and they're mystic. I'm not talking anything about that. What I'm saying here is what we see is that God also created stones. And when humanity is silent and not worshiping him, he's able to use anything he wants to to fall down at his feet and worship him. The Jews have rejected Yahweh. The Philistines never had Yahweh as their God. But what about the stone itself? When speaking of the wedding in Cana, remember Jesus, John chapter 2, or John chapter, John chapter 2, Jesus can't drink anymore, goes to a wedding in Cana. Remember what he does there? He turns water into wine. And there is a poet named Alexander Pope that speaks of that event. And this is what the poet said about the water turning into wine. It's poetry. It's just one line, but listen to how he said it. The conscious water, as if it could think, the conscious water saw its master and blushed. The conscious water saw its master and blushed. What kind of a man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? All these images of God over all of his creation. When Jesus walked into Jerusalem for the last time, uh, the story goes, we call it Palm Sunday, but the story goes that uh, he was riding in on the foal of a donkey, a young colt of a donkey. And that the people, the remnant, those that did accept Jesus as Messiah, laid down blankets onto the colt. Uh, they laid their coats onto the colt so that Jesus could sit on the colt. And they laid blankets and coats on the floor. And they put palm branches on the ground as he's making his entrance into Jerusalem. And they were crying out, Hosanna in the highest. God save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. They were accepting this small group of Jews. 
We're accepting Jesus into the land, into Jerusalem, the week of his crucifixion, as the king of Israel. What was the Pharisees' response? Shut them up. The Pharisees did not believe Jesus who, uh, is who he said he was. And it says in the scriptures, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Make them stop saying that you are Messiah, that you are the one who's blessed. Come in the name of the Lord, that you are the king of Israel. That is blasphemy. Make them stop. What does Jesus say? Interesting, this stone motif. Jesus answered, I tell you, if humans become silent, even the stones will cry out. Was Jesus just being silly? Was he just being silly? Is something cute to say? Or was Jesus saying, when humanity won't worship me, my creation still will? Psalm 19, 1 says, the heavens declare the glories of God. How many men are declaring the glory of God today? Very few. The funeral yesterday, a lot. But we're a small group. And God says, when humanity won't worship me, my stones will even cry out and worship out of the mouth of the Savior. Don't add anything else to what's there. This isn't mystical. It's not strange. I've never heard a stone speak. We don't worship stones. I just got to guard the ministry against you going out and saying, I said something I didn't. All I said was that in Ashdod, in Philistia, no one was honoring Jesus and no one, I mean, uh, Yahweh and the ark, and no one was worshiping him. But that stone fell down, didn't it? I wonder if there's a picture there. Jesus was in Caesarea Philippi, and what's the story Jesus used of stone? He tells Peter, Peter, you are a rock, Petros, but it's upon this rock, this stone, the Petro. Um, Petra is the, is the Greek word. It's upon this stone, this rock, that I will build my church. You see the stone motif over and over. Even Satan tells Jesus when he's tempting him, turn these stones into bread. Make this inanimate object able to give life. Stones all throughout. And then you see in 1 Samuel chapter 7, Samuel put up this stone memorial to God that every time anybody sees the stones, you will remember that God has been here and has helped Israel thus far. It's just an interesting thing I had to bring out. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father.